morning. Welcome to worship at First Unitarian Church of Orlando. My name is Lisa Marie. I'm a member of the When You Worship team. In the words of Erica A. Hewitt, some of us are bringing our best selves to this space, and some of us are bringing our struggling selves, including pieces we might be ashamed of. All of us are welcome here, and all of us are loved. Some of us already have open hearts, and some of us aren't quite there yet, because our hearts have gotten a little beat up this week and might have forgotten how to open and trust. Your heart is welcome here, no matter how bruised. We welcome you among us. All of us are imperfect, but we're here to drop our defenses and trust what happens in worship is powerful and life-giving. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser than when we woke up this morning. We welcome you here. For more information about our congregation, go to www.orlandouu.org or email welcometeam at orlandouu.org. After service today at 1130, you're welcome to our final Path to Membership session in our Inquire series. Today, we talk about how the church is governed and sustained and how to connect and what is the Path to Membership. And all are invited to informal fellowship to gather with each other and chat for about 20 minutes. As I hope everyone knows, this month is generosity campaign. Packets were sent to your homes last week with a brochure, fair share guide, and a pledge card. You can return your pledge card by mailing it to the church or bring it to the March 27th drive up campus or just go to our website on the home page and there's a link to the generosity pledge. In advance, thanks for your generosity, which lights the way to our congregation's next era. The work of our congregation to welcome all of us, no matter the state of our hearts or our spirits into this beloved community is so important to me. So if you'd like to make an offering to support the many ministries of this congregation, go to orlandouu.org and click the donate button in the upper right hand corner. Send a text or send a check. Finally, remember that each month we invite gifts to our Share the Plate program that benefits one of our community partners that provides important services to the community. This month, it's the Healthcare Center for the Homeless. Just give a gift to share the plate in the same way it gives gifts, giving gifts to the church, noting that it's for our share the plate program. Or give directly to the center and send us an email so we can track our church's gifts. Now we gather in worship. Oh 
A call to worship this morning is adapted from Rachel Naomi Remen. Hidden in all stories is the one story. The more we listen, the clearer the story becomes. Our true identity, who we are, why we are here, what sustains us, is in this story. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. My name is Marnie Harmony. I served this church as its minister a number of years ago for quite a few years, and I am honored and delighted to have been named Minister Emerita. Nancy and I are so pleased to have been part of the history of this church. We love being part of its present, and we look forward so much to being part of the future of this congregation as it embarks on the wonderful process of calling a new minister and creating a whole new chapter in the life of the church. We are pleased to support the Lighting the Way Generosity Campaign. It is the custom in Unitarian Universalist churches to light the chalice as we begin our time of worship together. So will you please join with us as we say the traditional words of our chalice lighting. In the light of truth and in the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Good morning. I'm Sarah Gray, religious educator here at First Unitarian Church of Orlando. So today we're going to do something a little bit different than what we normally do in our story during the worship service. Today I wanted to share with you all a story from Spirit Play. So here's a little bit more about Spirit Play directly from the program's website. Spirit Play is a Unitarian Universalist program of religious education that evolved from a long line of Montessori-based religious education programming. Spirit Play seeks to engage children in the existential questions about life within the context of the Unitarian Universalist faith. Stories are presented dealing with these questions accessing our broad base of sources. They are presented using an active storytelling method followed by a wondering time that opens up the child's response to the story and then the child is free to work directly with the story or another or respond to the story um, with and their feelings about the story with various art materials and other manipulatives. So the RE program here um, has been really excited about the idea of introducing Spirit Play for quite some time now. Uh, Obviously, our plans got put on hold with uh, last year, but now we are optimistic that when we are able to return in person, we'll be ready to launch this new exciting way of doing RE, or new and exciting to us. It's been around for for a little bit of time, but uh, we're excited about bringing it to, to our congregation. So today I wanted to give you all a preview of what these spirit play stories, what these programs actually look like. We'll stop short of the work portion uh, in which the participant is invited to use or respond to the story using provided hands-on materials, but I can do the other parts. I can deliver the story in the active storytelling method and follow up with a wondering time for you all in your homes. So today's story is all about the first Unitarians in America. And I picked this one to serve as an introduction and give some context to the ideas that we'll be exploring later in our service today. We'll repeat this uh, next week. I'll do another spirit play story uh, with a similar story about the first universalists in America. So thank you for joining me on this new journey of storytelling today. The First Unitarians in America by Connie Dunn. Today's story is about the roots of our Unitarian faith and how they stretch back to the Puritans. When the Puritans first came to America, they built towns in New England, which is in the northeast of the United States. At the center of each town, helping control how the people lived and worked, was a church.
all the people in the town would go to that church, and they would pay money to support the church. It was part of the Puritan faith that churches should be simple, and that each church should decide important things for itself. Things like who would be the preacher, and what the people would do in worship. Here are the preachers. They want to roll away. Over time, the Puritan churches came to be called congregational churches. Each congregation could make their own decisions, but they still thought of themselves as being like all the other churches that had been Puritan. The ministers and preachers would even trade places so that different congregations could hear different sermons and ministers. But then some of the preachers started to preach that instead of a trinity, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that there was just one God and Jesus was a man. These people were called Unitarians. Their ideas upset the other churches and preachers, and soon they were arguing and refusing to trade with each other anymore. Then one minister named William Ellery Channing gave a big sermon that a lot of people saw. His sermon talked about the ideas of the Unitarians and how they were different from the other churches. After his sermon, many churches voted and became Unitarian, while most of the other churches eventually became the United Church of Christ. Each church got to choose for themselves which they wanted to be. I wonder if you've ever seen any of this before. I wonder which part of the story was the most important. I wonder which part you like best. I wonder where you might be in this story. I wonder if there is a part of the story that we could just leave out and still have a story. I wonder which part of the story you liked. I wonder how it feels when you argue. I wonder if you've ever had an argument. I wonder how Channing felt to talk in front of all of those people. I wonder if our church could ever change to a different kind of church. I wonder if this lesson reminds you of any of our Unitarian Universalist promises. I wonder where the spirit of love and mystery is in this story. We enter a time of mindfulness, of meditation and prayer. And as always, we begin with the hearing of the joys and concerns in our congregation and in, and in the world. It is with heavy heart that I tell you of these concerns from Neil and his family who share that two family members are dealing with serious health diagnoses. His mother, Mary Lynn, has a serious form of cancer and her focus going forward is quality of life. At present, there are no symptoms. And around the same time as they found out about that diagnosis, Adina was diagnosed with breast cancer. Some tests she had last week will show how serious it is and they will know this week of that. Our hearts and our hopes and our love are with Mary Lynn, Adina, and Neil, as well as the children. We will walk with you through this. And it is also with a mixture of sadness and joy that I announce that the Reverend Janet Newman, a member of our congregation, is moving to Ohio in a few weeks. 
She is entering a continuous care retirement community in Oberlin, Ohio, and she selected that property based on its Quaker principles, similar to our Unitarian Universalist principles. Reverend Janet served this congregation as interim minister early in her career, and then in 2019 came out of retirement to serve as bridge minister between the leaving of the Reverend Kathy Schmitz and my arrival that August. She says, I have known this congregation for 34 years and served you twice as your minister. You have been a mainstay in my life and I've cherished my time with you. I will return to visit as soon as I can. I carry you in my heart. Thank you for all the good you have done for me. And Janet, thank you for all the good you have done for this congregation. And we honor you and your journey forward with joy and we grieve your will not be with us as much as before. As always, we remember the unspoken concerns in our congregations, and we know that the light of the sacred shines into the dark and pro places of our lives and all life. And now let's take a deep breath together. As a reminder of how deeply we connected, we are with each other, and with all. And now, let's sing to open our heart. When we go into the silence, you may use either Facebook comments or YouTube chat to name anyone in your life in each prayer, remembering or honoring in our communion of names. We begin with a meditation from Beverly and David Bumbaugh. Our church exists to proclaim the gospel that each human being is infinitely precious, that the meaning of our lives lie hidden in our interactions with each other, we wish to be a church where we encounter each other with wonder, appreciation, and expectation, where we call out of each other strength, wisdom, and compassion that we never knew we had. Spirit of life, spirit of love, on this day of light, we are grateful for our community, grateful for the light we receive from each other, grateful for the light we give to each other. For those journeying in darkness, we ask for sustenance, for clarity, for openness. May light surround us and love enfold us as we walk together. And so we are mindful of the sufferings in our community and our world, we pray for all those who are hurting in any manner of body, mind, or spirit. For these and for all, we pray for a greater sense of peace, fulfillment, health, vigor, relationship, abundance, acceptance, and sufficiency in all things. Now, with the private meditations of our hearts, we enter the silence and the communion of names. And 
And so it is. And so we pray. Blessed be. Amen. My name is Michael Mataluni, and my family and I are members of One U. And the reason we were originally attracted to One U uh, was because we were looking for community. We were looking for a place where we can connect with like-minded people. Um, my wife and I both come from challenged religious backgrounds, and we were looking for something that wasn't dogmatic, that we could find a home and raise our children. And that's exactly what we found in One U. Um, I think the reason we're still members today and the reason we continue to contribute um, you know, both our time and our financial resources to One U is because of the work that One U does um, with the organizations that it does it with. Uh, sometimes things don't always get done quite as quickly as we would like, but we know that the that's because of the amount of deliberation and rational focus that goes into everything that we dedicate ourselves from sharing the plate uh, and beyond. And I think that it's so valuable to have the opportunity to give to an organization uh, where we know where the money goes. We know it's not going to any top administrators. It's, it's really going directly to the source. So we believe in One You. We believe in the the people and the mission because, uh, you know, the like minded people that we connect with um, and the causes that we focus on really matter to myself and my family. Yeah.
Unitarian Universalism is composed, of course, of Unitarianism and Universalism, both historic American faith traditions. The two were consolidated in 1961 to become the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Today we explore our Unitarian story. Next week we'll look at our Universalist heritage. Each time we will look at our history with an eye to better understanding how that history informs our 21st century practice of our faith. I've subtitled today's sermon, A Stream of Light. No, I'm borrowing that title. It's a short history of Unitarianism from our late and beloved Dr. Conrad Wright. Today's sermon is a little bit of the story of the beginnings of our way in faith, a movement toward, as our opening hymn phrased it, the freer step, the fuller breath, the wide horizon's grander view. It is a movement, perhaps, from darkness to light. Now, Unitarianism actually has two birth stories. One is in Europe at the time of the Protestant Reformation. The first emergence of what would be called Unitarianism was in Poland in the 1550s. It migrated to Transylvania, now Romania, and then eventually to England. But our American Unitarian story is our most direct uh, and, and closest to our own Unitarian Universalist history. Sarah's children's story, done in spirit play form, told the essentials of the early parts of that story. The old Puritan churches of New England came to be known as congregational churches, so-called because congregational governance was their uh, distinctive. They were free churches, gathered and sustained locally. Though they were theologically orthodox for the times, they were radical in the way that they gathered themselves as bound in freedom in the idea of covenant. Every town, as the story said, had a congregational church very frequently at the center of town, and that centerness was not just where the building was located. That also said something about the place of the church in the wider community. It was deeply intertwined with the community. The Puritan faith was simple and it was direct. The liturgy in worship services was low. That is to say, there were very few smells and bells. It was mainly reading of the Bible and interpreting it through uh, word and in song. The nation grew and congregational churches grew along with it and spread. And by the later 18th century, this, the late 1700s, there was a growing tension among the churches. Some came to hold more liberal view distinct from the older, more orthodox Calvinist views. The big difference in the liberal view was rejecting the idea of original sin. They thought that human nature, that, that thought was that human nature is at base depraved and in need of redemption. The liberals thought that indeed human creatures are still prone to sin, but they also have an inner goodness. They are born with this inner light, even inner divinity granted to them by God. And the second difference gave them their name. They were Unitarians, not Trinitarians. Trinitarianism traditionally declared Jesus as having the same substance as God. This was an important theological point, the same substance as God. Jesus was fully divine and yet fully human, a transrational understanding of the Christ story, while the liberals of that generation took a more rational understanding of the biblical narrative. They saw Jesus as supernaturally divine in a way, but not equal to the Father God. This actually had been an old idea in the first couple of centuries of Christian hi uh, history that was declared a heresy by the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century. The liberals arrived at these ideas and others by their use of reason in biblical interpretation and in religion generally. They approached the Bible as a totality, as a collection of books, books from different parts of the world at different times in human history. 
and these books would naturally reflect the culture and peculiarities of the day. They understood that the Bible reflected human experience, that it was not merely divine instruction that pops out of the clouds directly from heaven. This was a hint of what is called the higher criticism of biblical work that would appear later in the century from German scholars and still influences biblical understandings today in what is called the historical critical method of, of biblical interpretation. Well, in 1819, it was becoming apparent that there might be a split between the Orthodox and the liberal Congregationalists. So the liberal clergy planned for a way to better set forth their core ideas of what constituted their theology in as clear and concise of a way possible. So they strategically chose an emerging leader among the liberal clergy, one William Ellery Channing, minister of Federal Street Church in Boston, who was known to be an articulate and powerful preacher despite or Maybe it was because of his gentle manner. They arranged for Dr. Channing to preach the ordination sermon for Jared Sparks, a recent graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Now, one of the things that set off the whole argument between the Orthodox and the liberals was years earlier when Harvard Divinity School went liberal. One of its important chairs was went to a liberal scholar. So in 1819, this was not to be a mere ordination service, though. It, was, it would be what we would call today a media event designed to make a national impact. The sermon was to be published in pamphlet form as well as sermonized to help spread the ideas. And they thought that Baltimore, a vital what they called Western city, it was Western because it was west of Boston, uh, an outpost far removed from Boston might be just the place to talk about this progressive pioneering faith. So on May 5th, 1819, Dr. Channing ambled up to the pulpit at First Independent Church and began his sermon. That building is still there today uh, called First Unitarian Church. His sermon was titled simply Unitarian Christianity. Now, it is sometimes called the Baltimore Sermon. The church in Baltimore was new. It was a daring example of modern design for the time. But it is said that the acoustics in the sanctuary were terrible. One of Baltimore's Orthodox ministers told his congregation following Dr. Channing's sermon, the Orthodox minister said, there has been a new church erected in our city for the dissemination of pernicious doctrines. But by the grace of God, nobody can hear what the minister has to say. <laughs> Indeed, it is remembered that only those sitting in the first three or so rows that day could hear chanting. The others had to wait to read the printed sermon, which was available on that very day in pamphlet form as they left the sanctuary. So that sermon, though it couldn't be heard well on the day it was preached, was eventually heard around the nation as a clarion cry for a new, more expansive, broad, and free religion that had ever been heard on the American shores before. Presses worked overtime to fill demand for the reprints, and so the sermon galvanized the liberals so that they would leave the Congregational Fellowship and form their own association of churches, and in 1825, the American Unitarian Association was formed. In 1961, of course, the American Unitarian Association joined with the Universalist Church of America to form our current association, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Now, in the early 19th century, the new American Unitarian Association carried forth some of the core ideas that Channing voiced in an 1819 sermon of human progress, use of reason, of the search for truth, of the need for spiritual freedom, of the benevolent character of God. The Unitarian churches of that generation were largely composed of highly educated, elite, and prosperous individuals 
well-placed in the society of their time, in business, finance, education, industry. They were a privileged group. They naturally leaned into some of the social reforms of the day, given their expanded way of thinking about religion, and sometimes they carried with them into that work their own largely privileged understandings. Channing himself gives one interesting case in point. Channing was late in criticizing slavery, and it wasn't because he was for slavery, not that at all. In fact, as a young man, he had seen up front the evils of slavery, but he criticized the, what he thought was the overly harsh rhetoric of some of the abolitionists. He eventually changed course, voiced an anti-slavery position in his ministry there at Federal Street Church, and published a book on the subject in 1835, arguing that slavery was a sin against God. And his own congregation in Boston strongly disapproved of his stance. Now, none of them were slaveholders, but many of them likely had financial interest in slaveholding enterprises. He remained minister in name, at least, at Federal Street Church, but he distanced from that ministry, which on the one hand freed him to write more for a growing national and international audience far beyond his own Unitarian borders. He died in 1842 with only tenuous ties to the congregation he had served for so long. This is one example and a warning against approaching our own faith history with too much of a romantic view where we always come out as the heroes. We too, our ancestors at times, have failed in meeting the challenges of the times. At other times we have met the moment, notably consider in the generation following Channing, of Ralph Waldo Emerson, himself a Unitarian minister, whose transcendentalist teachings would take the idea of religious freedom far beyond what Channing would have endorsed. And in that same generation, Theodore Parker, a famous Unitarian minister, who was a notable reformer in the anti-slavery work, and there were many others. The Christian character of Unitarianism began to shift as the 19th century progressed, as they, I think, naturally follow their own hearts for a search for truth. Though Christian Unitarianism continued among our churches through the 19th and end of the 20th century, over the generations our faith vocabulary has increased, and our Christian heritage now takes its place among other sources of our faith traditions. That we have expanded to include so many sources for our faith and evolve to a pluralistic faith seems evident given our heritage. If you look at the essential theology of early 19th century Unitarian Christianity, you see a progressive and liberal Christianity that took the idea of what in later generations was called freedom, reason, and tolerance and applied that to the religious ideal. It is from these three elements, freedom, reason, and tolerance, of original Unitarianism that we see the seeds for a larger and more pluralistic faith. We see the seeds of a light shining forth, a light that had been buried at the heart of the Puritan experience and the radical ideas of the essential divine freedom in the idea of covenant, but dimmed by their overly zealous approach to living a God-fearing life and the encroachment of human superstition upon the idea of a simple religion related to everyday life. This light, of course, is perhaps the reflection of a greater light, a light hiding at the heart of all creation, of truth beyond all of our little ideas, of a love beyond often our own pettiness, of a true religious unity beyond all of our religious divisions. I recall a story told by a more recent Unitarian Universalist minister, author Robert Fulgham, the popular author a couple of decades ago of the book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. In another one of his books, Fulgham tells the story of a child in Nazi Germany during the devastation of the Second World War. The boy one day found a small piece of a broken mirror out in the countryside, Fulgham said, probably 
left over from a broken motorcycle mirror. The boy carefully smoothed the hard edges of the mirror with the rock so he wouldn't cut himself. And he used this simple mirror as a toy. He said he would keep it, keep it in his pocket and use it to shine light into dark places, seeing how he could refract the light to go other places. As a grown man, he later gave this mirror to Fulgham. Symbolic, he said, of the light that Fulgham brought forth in his ministry of writing that so blessed our nation. I think Channing was like that. A man, even for his faults, a man who reflected light. Now, Channing himself was not the light, despite his brilliant intellect, despite his beautiful preaching, despite the fact that a whole movement organized around him. The light did not come from him. The light does not come from us. But the light worked through him, and it works through us is reflected in us so that we might participate in bringing light to the world, in blessing the world. At the end of that sermon, Channing closed his exposition about all the Unitarian doctrines and spoke for a moment to the young man who was being ordained. And he exhorts young Jared Sparks to live out his beliefs, Channing said, if any light can pierce and scatter the clouds of prejudice, it is that of a pure example. My brother, may your life preach more loudly than your lips. And so Channing, I think, would say to all of us here, ordained or not, in these challenging days of the 21st century, May your life preach more loudly than your lips so that light can pierce and scatter the clouds of prejudice, especially these days. So may it be. Amen. extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we <laughs> hold in our hearts until, until we, we are, are together, together again. again. Probably ought to redo that. <laughs> Remember, my friends, we haven't just been to church. We are the church. And when the church is the church, it is nothing more. It is nothing less. It is nothing other than a place of light in a darkening world. This week, in all you do, be the church, be light. Go in grace. Amen.